Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the North America Virtual KubeCon. Today I'm going to give you a deep dive on the six scheduling and uh, a little bit on myself. My name is Wei Huang, I work at IBM. I'm also the co-chair of the six scheduling. So today's content is separated into three parts and at each part we want the content is delivered to the exact audience. So we separate them onto different personas from the uh, Kubernetes beginner to some scheduling expert. So what we want to that the content to be delivered so that the specific audience can absorb easily. Okay, the first kind of audience we are targeting uh, those regular users who just write and uh, deploy their applications onto the Kubernetes platform. So for them, they just want to know some scheduler basics so that they can use the scheduler feature, features efficiently and correctly. And also they want maybe want to do some basic troubleshooting to identify whether the issue is belongs to scheduler or other components. And for sure, they want, don't want to go too deep into their scheduler internals. So for them, Further thing is to answer then what Kubernetes scheduler does. So in one sentence, Kubernetes scheduler just find all the pending paths and assign the path to the most best fit node. So that's it. And in terms of uh, API perspective, so the pending means the node that doesn't have a spec down node name field set is empty. So you can see from the picture. And then scheduler will go through some internal logic and will find that it's the best node for the incoming part and then assign the part to the node. In this case, the spec node name was sent to uh, can worker two. So this is basically scheduler does. And with that being said, there's some things I need to mention that which Cuba scheduler doesn't do which are uh, often misunderstood by the users, like quota enforcement. This is the thing that the admission plugins does at the part creation time instead of scheduling time. And also uh, spinning up and scaling down the replicas of uh, deployment is the job of container manager because they are responsible for manage the number of replicas meets the desire uh, number. And also, it's the kubelet responsible for evict the running paths, maybe because the uh, worker node has running out of memory, running out of disk, etc. Et so I list a few of the uh, common misunderstanding that people would think that this thing belongs to scheduler, but it doesn't. So understanding this will help you better identify the issues whether it belongs to a scheduler or not. And the next, we will give a very high level introduction about the scheduling flow, the most basics. So once a scheduler gets a path, it goes through uh, internal scheduling cycle. The scheduling cycle will schedule the path one by one. And one scheduling cycle can be divided into several phases. The first one is called filtering. So filtering tries to answer the path's hard constraints. It's like answer your question like, as a user, I need my path to be scheduled to a node which has two, gig two gigabyte memory, or I need my path to be scheduled to a node which, so that to code exists with some kind of path. So this kind of requirements, I call them hard requirements. They must be satisfied and all the hard constraints are ended, not all. And uh, in terms of the hot constraints, they are usually, I think in 99% of the cases are from the path spec, which are specified directly by the user. For example, the path request and the path affinity. So notice there, here the primitive starts with required. So if you read out some term starts with require is usually 
the hard requirement because, because it's required. And uh, some other primitive use other terms like uh, the pop project spread feature use uh, uh, constant string to identify this is a hard constraint that if the constraint cannot be satisfied, then do not schedule this part. So you can usually tell from the uh, literal meanings to tell whether it's a hard constraint and or a soft constraint I will later mention. This is uh, important because only hard constraint, only unsatisfying hard constraint will make your part into a pending status. And next phase, so suppose you have 100 nodes and only 10 nodes has passed the filter phase. Then we go to the next phase called scoring. So scoring in contrast of the filtering are best efforts. So they try to answer some question like, I prefer my pod to be scheduled to a node which has SSD, but if that node doesn't have, it doesn't matter. I just want scheduler to try its best to do this kind of thing. So based on this soft constraint, uh, each filtered node, filter means that node has passed the filter filtering constraint. Those filtered nodes will get a score and we aggregate those score and, and finally pick up the highest score and assign the path to the node which has the highest score. So I want to highlight that in terms of soft constraint, it doesn't block scheduling your path. It's just describe a relation of preference. I prefer my path to be scheduled onto some, some node. And uh, maybe there are some soft constraint conflict with each other, so it happens. So that in the, the soft constraints has have two sources. The first one is from the path spec. You can identify some soft constraint in the path spec like part of node affinity and the, the primitive starts with preferred uh, blah, 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 blah. So this is the soft constraint. And usually it comes uh, with additional parameter like weight so that can give the user a customized weight so that I favor this constraint more than other constraints, soft constraint. And also some features are using other primitive, which are usually self-descriptive, like when the pile cannot be satisfied, I will still schedule it anyway. So this is a soft constraint. And there's another kind of soft constraint, which are not specified by the user. Instead, usually specified by the cluster admin upon the scheduled startup. So they are called, I call them implicit scheduler config. So they are sort of uh, scheduling policies, like the default policy tries to use the node which has the least allocated resource as possible so that uh, it will try to make the cluster, the utilization balanced rather than being packed or the pods to one single node. So this is for soft constraint. And uh, you may think about think of a question that what if no node can satisfy all the cost, hard constraint in the filtering phase, what should we do? So we have a special phase called preemption. So preemption is only triggered when there's no node can satisfy the hard constraint. And uh, it will see whether there are low priority candidates which can be sacrificed, can be preempted to make room for the high priority path. If this is possible, a scheduler will go preempt the low priority path to make room so that the high priority path is schedulable. So in terms of API, you have to define the priority class uh, and specify their value. The higher the value, the more important the priority is. And in terms of the path spec, you'll define the spec dot priority class name and correspond to that priority class, which the scheduler will honor in the runtime. 
All right, uh, this is pretty much, I think, in day one, a regular scheduling user uh, needs to know about the basics of the scheduler. And uh, you just need to learn that scheduling has basically three phases, filter, scoring, and preemption. And uh, if you see a part is in pending status, first ensure that the part spec domino name is not set so that it's in the scope of scheduling, which you are trying to schedule the part onto the node. And also use kubectl describe that part to check which constraint, how the constraint is not satisfied, okay? So in the part in pending status, you check those kind of, go through those simple troubleshooting steps. But if a part can be scheduled, but it's not the design node that it is scheduled onto. There is usually something wrong in the scoring, plugin scoring uh, phase, maybe some default scoring policies that given by the cluster admin doesn't fit your workloads. You need to check with them or you do some debug to see why one score policy is weight higher than the other. So this is basically for uh, record users. All right, uh, for day two, you, we are targeting the audience as cluster enemy or DevOps. So the goal here is a little different. So you are not only satisfied of treating schedule as a black box. Instead, you want to uh, know more about schedule internals and to get to know some configuration back best practices and also understand how the scheduling behavior correlated to internal, we call it the scheduling plugins, so that you can make the most of scheduler and expose them to the end users. And of course, you don't want to write additional code, no matter it's a scheduler extender or plugin, you just do uh, make a customize the scheduler with the official scheduler image. So the first thing you can look into is configuration. So con configuration as time goes changes a lot in the recent Kubernetes releases. And the first thing I want to mention is that uh, don't use command line arguments anymore because we have a better design uh, and organized object called cube scheduler configurations so that you can pass on all the individual command line arguments through that config object, through the dash dash config uh, parameter. But if you are still at like Kubernetes 1.7, you have to still adapt to the, to the old style uh, kind of cube schedule configuration. And the second thing is, even inside the cube scheduler configuration, there are different versions, vary from V1 alpha one to V1 beta one. And the difference is, is that before V1 alpha two, uh, we are still using the old execution paths or old terms like prior decays corresponding to filtering and priority corresponding to scoring. And they are a little bit different in terms of their naming and the execution paths. So if you are uh, still using the old config, you may be using something called the policy file. So the policy file is something like this. You define a cube schedule config uh, with we run of one version and specify one policy as the policy file. And inside of the policy file, if you want to customize some behavior, you have to list all the predicates or the priorities, even if you just want to change one. So that is not good user, user experience, right? And also here you can see that you have to provide two files. One is the cube schedule config, one is the policy file itself. It's also not user friendly. So uh, as time goes, we want to deprecate this kind of policy-based config. And instead, we are transitioning to 
a plugin based config. So plugin is simply a functional unit that is uh, written to satisfy one specific constraint, either from the user's input or from some uh, uh, implicit uh, general policy. So right now, if you are using v1 alpha 2 or v1 beta 1, you can use the latest cube schedule configurations under the profiles uh, subfield. There is a plugin field so that you can specify, you can disable or enable or disable all the plugins there by writing the minimum YAML snippet as possible. So it's very user friendly and uh, the more importantly, so right now you can see that we, we have a new profiles uh, field. That means, so right now, starting with 118, your scheduler is not a single flavor scheduler. You can build a multi-flavored multi scheduler. I will give an example. So using the Viva Beta 1 configurations, here I define four profiles and default scheduler image first, the bean pack, skip, score, and they can map to different behaviors in runtime, the different scheduling profiles. Like the skip score is something that I totally just disable the scoring phase because I don't care about which node is highest, the highest score. I just want the part to be scheduled as fast as possible. And the bean pack, on the other hand, try to favor the node which has the most allocated resource as possible. So it's quite fit the, the requirements of autoscaler. Because autoscaler wants to save the cost of running machines. They want to pack all the workloads and minimum machines as possible, et cetera. And uh, in runtime, in your workload, you just specify the spec dot schedule name and correspond to the profile. So in the example that we have four uh, workload YAMLs and with different scheduler name and in runtime scheduler knows which specific flavor you want your workload to be scheduled. So that's the, I think the very key change in recent Kubernetes uh, releases. So back to this picture. So as a cluster admin, you should know exactly what each plugin is doing, not only by understanding their log logic and also knows their internal stuff like their arguments and how to configure them and how that arguments uh, reflect in terms of behavior. And here we have a page to list all the default plugins and which extension point they belongs to. For example, uh, tent toleration, it implements several extension point in filter phase, pre-score phase, and score phase. So as a cluster admin, if you want to enable or disable, or do some customization, I do recommend to check out this, uh, the, the official website. And also there are some plugins was compiled into the schedule image, but not enabled by default. So you can choose to enable them. But again, you should to understand the real semantics of them. And some of them are, have conflict with default ones. You, if you want to enable some of them, maybe you want to disable some of these default plugins. So that is the basic. Uh, the, Cluster and mean need to understand. In addition to that, uh, there are some other global settings in the cube scheduler config, like percentage of nodes to score, which are very useful if you're running on uh, 1,000 or 5,000 nodes. Uh, probably you don't need to score all the filter nodes. You just need to score maybe 10% or 20% of the nodes because scoring is more to favor one node to, to the other. So some of the workloads just care about whether it's hot, 
constraint is has been satisfied and don't quite care about the soft constraints. So that's a very useful features. And uh, as a cluster admin, you may want to catch up with the latest uh, progress in the upstreams. I listed a, a few of them here. And the eventual goal is that you, I suppose just, it's like you are running a burger shop, like right? In the before, you just provide one flavor burger, which it has uh, meat, onion, uh, and uh, tomatoes, that's it. You use it, just can take it or leave it. Uh, right now, you can have, you have multiple ingredients, right? You can compose them and into different flavors, like it's a veggie one, it's a, uh, with beef, it's with chicken, and with beef, you can also divide it into with uh, green, green onion or with raw onion or with uh, tomatoes without tomato, etc., etc. So you can, the image is still the same image, but you can provide more flavors so that to adapt to your user's workload. So this is basically the, uh, I think the trusted admin wants to learn. Okay, let's go to day three. Day three, we are talking to the audience which are usually skating experts or innovators. It's like you're still running a burger shop, but you are not satisfied with existing ingredients. You want to make some innovative ingredients from outside, for example, then provide more flavors than the default schedule image provides. So in this case, they don't care about writing some sort, sort of code. And uh, the ultimate goal is to fit diverse workloads such as batching workloads, which that the current schedule is not supporting well. Uh, but they are, they are not, they don't want to start from scratch to write a secondary scheduler because running a multiple scheduler will inevitably cause some conflicts on the part of scheduling. So for this kind of users, still go back to this picture. You should not be satisfied with only knowing that the filtering has some uh, plugin XYZ and the scoring has plugin XYZ. You need to understand, for example, why we need pre-filter and how to use pre-filter, right? Pre-filter, for example, is a phase that, especially for the requirement that you need to consider cross-node cross uh, status so that you need to do some pre-calculations and put that result into sort of a cache and that result can be used later in filter phase. That's for pre-filter. And also you need to understand what pre-permit is and what reserve is, right? Reserve is the phase that you can, before you part get scheduled, you can make an optimized uh, assumption that this part has been scheduled so that you assume this part of resource in the scheduling cache. And the permit is a very useful extension point that uh, you can wait until a certain criteria, like a group of paths come inside, uh, all of them are satisfied and you approve all this of paths in batch. So this permit is a useful extension point in the uh, batch workloads. And also post filter is a new extension point we introduced in 119. It replaced the old hard coded preemption logic so that it's the preemption uh, logic is more extensible. Like in the before we just, in the default preemption, we just consider the strategy to preempt the node, sorry, preempting the path on a single node. But sometimes it's not, not the case and you want to extend this behavior, like you want to preempt one group of paths and that kind of uh, one group paths may be scheduled onto different nodes, et cetera. And also you need to follow up with the uh, latest change in the scheduling framework 
and uh, just read through the release note. If you have any questions, go to the Slack, to the mailing list, to, to raise your concern. And uh, also, we we are going to uh, GA the scheduling framework in 120. Uh, we have started to build this framework since 115. Uh, now we are able to say that it's stable enough. It can be go to the next stage. Uh, all right, it's still the same topic that if you want to implement one specific features, you should know which specific extension point you want to extend and write the corresponding uh, logic there. For example, uh, if you want to do a gas scheduling requirement, you may need to implement this kind of uh, extension point. And if you want to do some uh, scoring plugins, you need to implement the pre-score and score extension point. So that, so with the default scheduler on the base, you build something on top of that. And finally, you get, you compile them together. And then you get a unified scheduler binary. It's a new, new binary, which has 100% of the vanilla scheduler functionality, as well as the additional functionality you built into it. And uh, because uh, building a scheduling plugin has, a, I, I won't say it has a high bar, but it has a bar. So we initiated a sub project called Scheduler Plugins, which uh, writing some examples there and some guidance there for you to start with. So right now we already have some caps on GAN scheduling, um, capacity scheduling, um, capacity scheduling is about elastic quarter, and also some uh, ongoing care like which uh, favors to use some real time metrics of the cluster to do scheduling decisions, etc. And also we uh, uh, do some CI optimizations to do automatic build and which so that you can just download the image from kubernetes.gcr.io. All right, and this this is pretty much for the day three. So that still the, the analogy that you're running a burger shop. So right now you can use the default ingredients from the upstream and also you can buy some other ingredients from the local market, right? You can buy some special cheese, you can buy some special ingredients, hazelnut or what, who knows, and uh, combine them together to provide additional flavors to for your user to use. And the last, uh, feel free to contact us and uh, you can find all the information here. We have weekly meetings, raise your topic there and uh, help us uh, build this community better. All right, thank you. I think this is pretty much for today's session. Thank you.